if there's any message I need to send. Okay. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to kiss you down. I'm coming. Attention. Coming to dance. Attention. We're gonna dance. We're gonna dance. Attention. Hello everyone and welcome to this week's edition of Chat Night Africa. Chat Night Africa straight talk on matters that matter. If the matters matter to you, we care about them because we care about you. This is Chat Night Africa live from Washington DC metropolitan area. Production Supervisor, Dr. B. Tatsong Fomundam. Broadcast Transmission Director, Mumbalingwa. Studio Manager, Beatrice Fomunen. This is Chat Night. Our social media platforms are managed by uh, Sir Roger Full. This is Chat Night Africa Live from Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Production assistants, Emmanuel Wayindi, John Tanto, and uh, Lock Benson at Fonta Street, Bamenda. Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be one sandstorm, firestorm of a broadcast this week. And my guest this evening, I told you at some point we were not done with her. Lillian, Lillian Famunung. And that is Lillian Fomunung. Watch what she has for you. If you're a cardiac patient, please walk away. This is not a show for you. Thank you, Lillian, for coming on the show one more time. This is Chat Night Africa from Washington, D.C., metropolitan area. Chat Night Africa is compiled and presented by Divine, Divine Chamukon. Ladies and gentlemen, serious things are about to begin. Welcome to Chat Night Africa Live. Chat Night Africa Live is the only place where the world meets Africa. In this edition, on our platform, we bring to you... Hello, my name is Lillian Fomenu. All right, this Sunday is going to be a fantastic show on Chat Night Africa. Divine Chamukong and the Lillian 
they will be talking on could you be your own problem Lillian Fomonum after her high school she got a job as a TV presenter with Cameroon Radio and the Television Corporation and that was in 1986 she worked with CRTV from 1986 to 1989 this was at a time when the technology of TV was just in its second year in Cameroon TV was introduced in Cameroon in 1984 this evening we are going to that topic and give you a few tips on how to Passing of the Nigerian University Entrance Examination, commonly known as JAM, that is Joint Admission and Matriculation, made Lilian Fomonung in 1989 to resign from CRTV. She was admitted into the University of Meduguri in Bono State, Nigeria. Two years later, she obtained an associate degree and later returned to CRTV. In September 1990, she got married. In 1994, Lilian Fomonung and her one-year-old daughter left Cameroon and they joined her husband in the United States of America. While in America, Lilian Fomonung earned a nursing diploma from the Atlanta Technical College, a Bachelor of Science degree in Healthcare Administration from the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, and a Master of Science in Clinical Research from Walden University. She is a supporting mother of three beautiful girls with over 20 years of working experience in nursing. Lillian Fomonung on her words, she says, I love people, so you can always find me in the company of people. I love to sing, God has given me a lovely voice and I love to use it to praise him. I am a drama, so I love to read romance, fiction. I love to watch movies, but most of all, I love to travel. I would have traveled the world if I could. In 2014, I set a goal for my family that we will visit seven wonders of the world. We have accomplished two, Niagara Falls and the Great Wars, five more to go. So COVID-19, please give way. That is Lillian Fomonong on her words. She will be part of the show this Sunday on Chat Night Africa Live. Do not miss it. This Sunday, the 30th of August 2020, at 9 p.m. Washington, D.C. time. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the introduction of my guest this week, Lillian Fomono. This is the woman who will be taking quite some difficult questions this evening. Hello, Lillian. Welcome to Chat Night Africa. Hello, Divine. Uh, thank you for that. As I was even watching that little short clip, I started wondering, was that really me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> there are so many thank facets. You. There's Thank so you. many facets of this individual anyway. Uh, so, but we're here to have a great conversation and I am happy to contribute in any way I can. And when it's time for me to open the phone lines to challenge Lillian, I will let that known. Hello, once again, welcome to this week's broadcast. Let me share with you what somebody told me. A smart communicator is someone who has the ability to tell you to go to hell and you look forward to taking the trip. Now, when somebody tells you, quote, I'm a straight shooter, or I tell it as it is, how does that person come across to you? Vicious or virtuous? Insensitive or a truth teller? Ladies and gentlemen, poor communication could lead to someone losing a case in court, even when the facts are on their side. 
poor communication could lead to wars between nations. And I've seen husbands and wives at each other's throats as a result of poor communication. I need, therefore, not emphasize, overemphasize the need for proper communication. Today, we explore the themes of pride, greed, hate, anger, demonstrating how these habits take people down destructive paths. Warning, if you're a cardiac patient, this broadcast is not for you. Lydian, first of all, I want to thank you for accepting this invitation to come on Chat Night Africa. The first and very provocative question I'm going to ask you is, are you a straight shooter? Um, I used to be. Uh, still, I still is. Um, I used to be and still is, just repeating it. Um, and it depends also on what you call a straight shooter. Now, I take it this way. I am old enough now, and like one of my professors in school used to say, heading down the hill and I'm not coming back up with you all, so I just can tell you exactly how I feel and what I think. However, because I'm a lot older now and mature, so I kind of, not being diplomatic about it, but being extremely reasonable and being um, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Now I think about it this way. If I'm going to tell you something, I first of all, rationalize it in my head. How would I feel if you told me just the way I want to tell it to you? Now, stretch shooting doesn't have to be, um, you don't have to be aggressive about it or you don't have to be cantankerous about it. You can, tell somebody something about the truth or you can tell somebody the truth without necessarily being aggressive. Now I'm going to take a motto from one of my uh, religious groups, uh, which I'm very passionate about the CWA. One of the prayer points says, Lord teach me to see you in everybody that I meet, to treat others, to say, to be firm, without embittering or embarrassing others. Okay, and I think that is very essential in verbal communication. Now, I was just going to limit it to verbal communication because as you yourself know, Divine, uh, being a student of communication, you know there are very many forms of communication, nonverbal, verbal, but we're going to limit it just to verbal communication because sometimes um, your words, words do matter. They matter a lot. What you say to somebody can either make or mar them. And depending on how the person is built, meaning how uh, psychologically strong or weak they are, your words can either totally reduce somebody to rubbles and lead them down the wrong path, or it can totally edify somebody and take them up. So your words matter. Therefore, am I a straight shooter? Yes, I am, but I do not anymore do it in the aggressive manner which when i was younger i thought oh you know just tell it as you see it and without actually taking care of people's feelings and knowing how it will affect them now how did i feel when i got the same thrown back at me um back then i really didn't care it really didn't matter because I, I thought about it as that's your opinion but there is some sense of arrogance in assuming that what you're saying to somebody, you know it all. So there's some sense of arrogance in that, which of course it boils down or it borders on immaturity. So if you're mature enough, you will know number one, you know nothing about everything. So once you know that, and once you come from that position of humility, then it will make you, even when you're telling the truth to somebody, it will make it come out receptive. Why do you think that people 
see court straight shooting or people just enjoy seeing a tell it as it is i'm a straight shooter what do you think is the motive behind that thinking some people do it some some people and like i say um, most of the time and i'm and i'm just going to bring this up say this in the most uh humbling way possible if you are if you truly are humble and come from a position of humility it is good to tell somebody you know the truth let them deal with it rather than uh, um, 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 cover it up or, or, or camouflage it. But also just because it's true, and I have this basic test for myself. I don't, I don't intend to have everybody go by that rule. But when you do apply those rules, it really, it will work out well, even when you're telling somebody the truth. Now think about it three ways. Even if you have something that is true, ask yourself these three questions. Is it true? Is it necessary? And is it worth it? Now, if those three, if you don't have the yes to those three questions, is it true? Is it necessary? And is it worth it? If you don't have the three yes to those questions, then shut up. That's just as simple as it is. Ask yourself those three questions. What I'm about to tell you, is it true? Even if it is true, is it necessary? Even if it is true and necessary, is it worth it? If not, shut up. Are you using your mouth to tear down people or to edify people? I think that's, that's the line the I get from you, Lillian. That's it. That's I, it. I, I know you say it, it, it was youth, what I'll call or describe as youth exuberance that oh, drove yeah. you oh, yeah. to just throw it out there in people's faces. It didn't matter how they felt. Yep. But you still think, see, adults who go around beating their chest mm -hmm. like tigers. Yeah that I'm a stretch shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, I, I say it as it is. The impression being that that's virtuous, that's a virtue. Why isn't that a virtue? Because Why do you think it's not a virtue? Because you have to come from a position of humility. It doesn't even matter, even if you, even if you have all the answers, even if you know it all, if you're not coming from the position of humility, where you tell yourself this, say this to yourself, how is the other person going to feel when I tell them what I have to say? If you put yourself in somebody else's shoes every time, I bet you, you will never go wrong. Put yourself always in somebody's shoes. There are some people, they don't care. And I think it's, in, it's being immature. That's all there is to it. But the danger about brash behavior, which is what it is, is that you you inadvertently um, hurt people's feelings and some people say well you know they're just feelings they'll get over it no think about the psychological damage that you do to somebody who is psychologically not strong enough to be able to weather the storm and then think about it how you come across with and and also take it this way i read a piece um for those of you who love the view the program the view if you read the piece on uh, Google, it was I think it was one of the updates that I had on Google about Sherry Shepard, what she was saying about what Barbara Walters did to her for three years that she was on The View. She said she cried every day in the dressing room. But when, of course, she came out, there was a brave face, right? But she in the, in the article itself, if you look at it, if you read it completely, you would think that Barbara was being wicked to her or everything. Well, but she said somehow it built her up. Why? Because she she had to go back and read because Barbara would tell her, you your arguments are uneducative and uneducated, and you don't argue with points, you don't have facts, you know, you've not read this. And she would go back and cry. But guess what? Because she needed that job so bad for the article, for what she says. She needed that job so bad, she had to go and work on it herself. And look at Sherry Shepard today. Okay, that's just one example. But psychologically, you have, how do you, how do you, if you find somebody who is not that strong psychologically to weather the storm, what do you do? You can kill people's dreams just by being brash. You can do that. And especially parents, our African parents, most of us, we do that. Our kids correct us. We don't listen. We say, well, this is always my defense. I was raised that way. I'm, <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with me. 
<laughs> so, so I don't see why. But this is a very fragile society. People are on the edge for different reasons. So there's there are stressors, and the least you want to do is add on to those stressors. You, somebody can just be on the tipping point, and you push them over. How are you going to feel about that afterwards? Lillian Fomenum. <laughs> What you tell somebody and how you say it is Modest. equally as important mm -hmm. as what you say to yourself. Mm -hmm. Lillian, talk to me a little bit. Uh, talk to the audience, people watching you. How can you, mm -hmm. in what ways can you, in holding that morning meeting with yourself in front of a mirror, mm -hmm. destroy yourself through how you talk to yourself? Okay. You tell yourself these few things. Okay. I had a. Uh, an, you can be uh, all the straight shooter <laughs> in the world you want. No, I had, older, I had an older. I had an older friend. Uh, it, it's mine. like it's it's <laughs> like you, you point a pistol at your face. Yes. And pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. How do many people do it in that pattern way? Okay. Uh, so, see, first of all, there has to be there's a there's a history of that in the background before somebody gets to that point where they are in front of the mirror and they're looking at themselves and having a talk with themselves and keep second guessing and doubting themselves. First of all, I'm not saying everybody, I'm just saying some people come from already a history of abuse. Now abuse is not, doesn't necessarily have to be physical, but verbal abuse, which is even more, it, it's even worse than the physical abuse in some cases, because some people who have been abused before victims say, the wounds will heal, but the words, remember what Maya Angelou said, my Angela said something in this light. I will always forget what you said to me, but I will never forget how you made me feel. Okay. So by the time you stand in front of the mirror and you're telling yourself, oh, I'm not good enough. Uh, I don't, I'm not smart enough. I'm not beautiful enough. That's because for years, someone, somewhere, whether it be your parent, whether it be your friends, whether it be your siblings, they've been telling you in the background sometime oh, don't do that, that's not even good for you, or don't do that, you're not good for that. And you have been believing that for a long time. Then now you're faced with the challenge with the world of things that you know deep down in you, you can accomplish. But because you keep doubting yourself, because you've been told for so long that you can't, that's why you stand in front of the mirror and say, you know what, this is just one more time. Well, I'm just gonna go out there and try it. I know I can't, I'm not good enough. And you tell yourself that and you actually start believing it. So it's not by chance that you have some people who get out with self-confidence because they've been told, even when things are tough, they've been it's been it's been ingrained in them that you're good enough, you can mount, you can climb any mountain just as long as you set your mind onto it and you can do anything you can do. I grew up practically that kind of way where um I knew and I was I was always told you are the best, get out there. And so I kept believing in that. But the downside or the good part about it is that that gives you some self-confidence and it builds you up where even when you're faced with challenges, things that you cannot do, but because you have that inert belief in you, which has been instilled and it's in your subconscious, guess what? You just feel like you can conquer the world. I said at the very start that today on the show, we will be exploring the themes of pride, greed, hate, anger, demonstrating how these habits take people down self-destructive paths. Lillian, let's switch gears. Let's talk about pride. Oh, gosh. Are you a prideful person? Um, if I'm, when I, if I'm going to say no, if I say no categorically to that is because that's what I know I'm not. I am not a proud person. But have sometimes my attitude or the way I carry myself given, you know, given people reason to think that way. I cannot say no, I haven't given people reason not to think that way because that will be coming from a presumption that I know what everybody thinks about me. Now, Personally, I'm going to tell you this. I am not a proud person. No. Why? Because I just believe that 
everything that I have or things that come my way or what I've been able to do, I have absolutely no control over it. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not even responsible for them, for the things that, you know, I have accomplished because I can only say I've put in my part. Uh, the rest of it have just been by the grace of God, period. Because there are things that have come my way that no way know how I deserve it. But for some weird reason and only by his grace have I been able to overcome those challenges and gone, you know, where, be where I am. So am I going to say I'm proud? No, that would be that would be vain, which which will just not even be true. But maybe just probably the way I carry myself. Maybe some people look at it or some people perceive me as a proud person. And I would wonder where that will be coming from and why that will be so. But if that is the case, but then I'm here to actually refute that I am not a proud person. No. Why shouldn't you be proud? Lillian, you're a very accomplished woman. Why um, shouldn't you be proud? Because none Don't of people that... have a right to be proud of or proud about their accomplishments. Well, because see, that would be wrong again because they'll be coming from the premise. They'll be coming from the premise that uh, they have something to do with about that. Now, if you're spiritual, like I am, if you go to your spiritual part, which is the center place where you have to be, you will know that all of these things have just come by by his grace. There is no reason, nothing that you did different from your next door neighbor who has not as much accomplished as you think you have, uh, that makes you any different. And of course, you, if you look at it also, uh, Divine, think about it. There is this Desiderata, which is unknown author, which says that what? Uh, don't be cynical about life, you know, and, and at the same time, there will always be a greater or lesser person than yourself. So that's why you shouldn't even be proud about what you have. Do yeah. you think, Lillian Formunung, that when people are proud, they know they are? Yeah, some people, yes, yeah, some people actually know they are proud. And what are the ingredients be, of prideful I behavior? Be that way. Let me give you an example. Um, I have or uh, something, for instance, like, um, you know, some people with kids that are well uh, uh, achieved or high achievers, uh, households that are high achieving, uh, uh, come from a background of high achievers and things that have happened. And they, they actually go on the limp and say, you know, and beat their chest and no, 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 think about it all of that can be taken away from you in a second. So that just shows you. Now, when COVID came, right, does COVID know whether you are uh, you live in the White House or you live in the shacks of, uh, in Chingai Lobby? It doesn't, you know, so so if it meets you, it will meet you. So, so one advice for people is um, be thankful, be thankful and not be boastful. Now, if you are thankful, if you are a thankful person, you will have no reason to boast. So that's the advice. Be thankful. Don't be boastful. This is Chat Night Africa. And now our phone lines are open. If you're watching this broadcast overseas, you can dial WhatsApp and you will be straight onto the platform. The number you can see rolling on the crawler, that's 001-240-603-6233. Uh, Let me caution you can only dial this number while we are live. If it's a replay, you dial, you not speak to anybody. <laughs> let me just let you know that. So anyway, we're live now. That's so funny. please, um, you can dial the number if you are in the United States or Canada, simply dial straight the number without a 001. Our phone lines are open. Lillian, people, especially, I mean, this day and age in social media, they buy a car, they put it on Facebook, and you've driven many high-end new cars. I didn't see one on Facebook. I don't know if you're hiding it. Uh, they buy a house. Uh, it's on Facebook. Uh, they buy a suit. It's on Facebook. I remember watching uh, Joyce Mayers saying, be careful. Um, your testimony doesn't become disguised bragging. Mm -hmm. 
Um, how do you how do you separate the two? Somebody genuinely giving testimony and mm -hmm. somebody bragging in 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 disguise. How do you separate? How do you draw the line? How do you detect it? Okay, see, okay, now for uh, I would go this, and I always do this, and it's it's really been part of the way I live my life and the way I look at it. I never, I try very hard not to second guess somebody's intention. I come always from a position of giving everybody the benefit of the doubt. So I try real hard not to second guess anybody's intention. But deep down in you, you will know when you are boasting instead of being, instead of giving, instead of testifying about the goodness of what God has done for you, you will know deep down in you if you're boasting. Okay, uh, let me give you, let me just get a random example. All right, let's say uh, you achieve this high-end job or you have this job that just came your way uh, and you went for the interview, you were, okay, let me give you an example. We were, we went for the CRTV interview when I was, this is in my teenage years, of course. So let me just go far back then. We were, um, I think for my interview, we were about, we were 10 of us and, and eight out of the 10 of us um, were, were completely, you know, uh, accomplished young women came from accomplished backgrounds and uh some of them had been on second men recommended uh by very high officials <clears throat> and i woke up that morning when i was going for the interview uh and i just actually it, it was by chance i never intended to be a crtv uh, presenter on television uh i was just going there uh because i i had I had had this zeal to to contribute something, uh, and actually, I was going as a script writer. Now, did I know anything about script writing? No, it was just an adventure. So I show up there, and uh, lo and behold, that morning I actually came down with a horrible cold the night before, and I was telling, saying to myself, "How am I going to? What am I going to say? Because this is a verbal interview. The first time it's going to be verbal first. They will have to judge you based on your presentation. And then here I am with this voice that is not even coming out. I have a cold. So I already talked myself into, well, let me just walk on there. And then my late uncle, I can never forget that morning. He got out of his bedroom and uh, came to the living room and asked his driver to come. He had just visit. He had just come back, come from, come in from Lagos, Nigeria, where he was the uh, the representative of the United Nations there. So he came up and he says to me, uh, and this was in Bali. So it, the translation is just going to be fluid. But if I say it in Bali, it really had the weight. He said, "Go out there." There are 10 of you. Yes, you do have a bad voice. And if they need one person, and out of the 10 of us, they needed just two people. And he told me, he said, even if there's going to be just one person that will be selected, you will be the one. And that's all he said. So I got out and I went to CRTV. And my panel, of course, there was Eric Chinje, there was Denise Epote, there was Charles Ndongo, there was uh, Esomba Yenge. And they were all, you know, uh, sitting there and... Uh, as soon as I walked in, the first thing that came into my mind was tell them exactly what's going on with you before you can even go and sit down for the interview. So as, as, as soon as I sat down, then I just said, excuse me, before you start the interview, and my voice couldn't even come out. I said, I do have a temporary setback. And they said, what is that? I said, I have a bad cold and my voice is going to be real hoarse and horrible. And they said, okay, that's fine. Let's go on. I had a passage in front of me. All I had to do was read that passage and communicate on television and answer their questions. They were live in the studio. And that went well. And out of my the 10 of us, of course, I scaled it. <laughs> so uh, those are some of the circumstances which, um, and I walked away from there. And each time, you know, people met me, you are wonderful, you are a good TV presenter, you are so and so. I never take credit for any of those things because guess what? It is all by the grace of God. Nothing of my doing at all, nothing that I have achieved especially when people tell me oh you've been married for ter almost 30 years fantastic what did you do nothing <laughs> you can't say you didn't do nothing nothing <laughs> it didn't come by chance god 
well, you're prepared for it. You have the skills to keep well, your marriage yes. going. Okay, yes. But uh, my husband has this saying that uh, luck is where opportunity meets prepare preparation, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you're funny. So, <laughs> kind of. So, so, yes, but there has to be some ground. You set some ground, some ground preparation before you can be able to challenge yourself for anything. But I just want to caution people, parents especially, do not break your child's spirit by bringing them down. If you are in the company of people, people, your friends, try to use your mouth and your tongue to edify people, lift them up. What was the saying again? Uh, that the only time you have a right to look down at somebody is if you're trying to what lace their shoes, right? <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Lillian, in what very practical ways does pride turn people into irritants where other people are, uh, or drive people down dangerous, self-destructive paths? Have you noticed that? Have you observed that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's some Give you some practical who, examples. Whose presence are just, they're simply obnoxious. They're just some people <laughs> who naturally are obnoxious. And, and there's little you can do about them. And sometimes when I find obnoxious people, I, again, not prejudging them. Number one is uh, some, some people are truly ignorant about the fact that they are ignorant. And they are ignorant about the fact that they come across that way. Some people know it as a fact and they wear it as a badge of honor. But most of the times, uh, Divine, if you, you think about it, none of this is really happenstance. Some people are people that have been deeply hurt by circumstances and then uh they 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 manifest it they manifest their hurt in in this behavior which is almost like a defense mechanism because they are daring you to come closer and that you they will never ever be hurt by nobody again and so they have this brash nature which turns people off but i always ask this question if you do a self-evaluation which is something which we all need to do like an introspection Get back home every time at night. Take one or two, 10 or 20 minutes of your time. Sit back. Look at your whole day's activity, your interaction with people, your interaction at your job, your interaction with your family. And think about exactly, take it step by step and see how your behavior affected your environment. Just take a look at it. Just think about it for a minute. Not until, uh, and I'm just going to use this example, which is, you know, hey, it's weird, but it's a fact, uh, I mean, it's something we can all reference. Now, when you see the head of, the, the president of this country, the way he behaves and the way he attacks left and right, I knew for sure there was something profoundly not right in probably in his experience in childhood. And the book by his niece, Mary Trump, just proved that. And it just proved, and if you talk to a lot of psychologists or psychiatrists or um, those who deal with mental issues, not to put down those who really have mental issues, that is all linked to that. But if you talk to them, those are some of the signs. When you have an adult who comes across br with brash behavior and don't care about who you're trampling on or how people feel, Take a look very well at them and try to understand them. They must have been very hurt in their childhood. They must have had experiences which has, is leading them to be the way they are. And so because of that, I try to, to, to forgive and try not to be judgmental, but try to understand that person being in their shoes. And most of the time, and I don't know how they feel because I would not want to be in the company of somebody with a brash behavior. No. I don't like that. I don't, I, I, it just disturbs my spirit. Because again, referring to that desiderata that I, to, I told you about, it says what? Avoid loud and aggressive persons. That is expression to the spirit. <laughs> uh, and Lillian, yes. the re and I had underscored the importance of this discussion. Pride. Uh, let me recall what my school principal back in the mid-70s used to say every time they had some disciplinary cases to handle in front of the student assembly, he will come and say pride goes before, before a fall. A fall. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And like you say, many people are prideful without really, sometimes they're conscious of it. And sometimes it's a manifestation of how they hurt. They hurt. Mm -hmm. The hurt that they actually went through. They profound hurt. Yes. Some people know how to get over hurt. Right. It could be hurt as a result of divorce. Mm -hmm. And so somebody who just divorced wants to go online and prove to the other party. To the other party. I am. <laughs> You think, you, you think I was nothing? You think I was nothing? And, and most times, they rush into another relationship, uh -huh, uh -huh. grab somebody thoughtlessly, That's right. and end up in the same place. That's right. Mm -hmm. You see, because the because of this element of pride, they, they, they're trying to show prove the other point. party, especially, yeah, proof a point, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes it is, a superiority complex mm -hmm. you know uh most people or a lot of people who are very prideful mm -hmm. uh, their thinking is that people admire them P people uh -huh. deify them they become deities to themselves uh -huh. in themselves uh -huh. they, they think they walk into a room prideful shoulder up chest out mm -hmm. and everybody's bowing, bowing. before them mm -hmm. I, I used to tell i mean as a joke that the the owner of this organization facebook mark zogerberg he's he's one of the simplest guys you can think of yeah. you could drive by him and not even know there's not a billionaire even know he's the one. that's right and and you see people who have much less than he has mm -hmm. behaving as if they owned the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so so yeah I, I, that's i bring up this to underscore the the importance the significance of what you just said that sometimes it's a manifestation of a, a, a profound hurt, hurt that somebody's actually going through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now tell me a little bit, Lillian, um, how prideful behavior is self-destructive. Oh my God. Oh my God. It is. Oh my God. The, 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 the um, how would we call it? The gain that you, that the supposed gain that a prideful person gets is very temporal. I wish they would just understand that the, the 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 thing the the benefit that you get from being prideful is so temporal that if you if you if you stay in that moment in that bubble you might miss the fact that it's going to burst in like in a few okay so yes you kind of if you are if you be, be mindful of the fact that once you start hitting your chest and telling yourself about all these accomplishments, all these things that you have done, how wonderful you are, how you have arrived. Know that in the twinkle of an eye, all of that can get away from you. Now, are you wrong to enjoy yourself in what you have accomplished? No. Go ahead and enjoy yourself, but also be mindful of the fact that none of that, none of what you're having and enjoying, none of it is actually due to anything you did greater than the next door neighbor who is down through them. No, it is only by his grace that you are where you are and have what you have. So just be thankful. Three years ago, Lillian, I, I, I went to Minnesota. I lost a cousin to cancer and we're driving through this graveyard. It is huge. I mean, huge. You can drive for miles and miles through and not seeing where the end is. And mm -hmm. somebody in the car remarked, lying below six feet mm -hmm. are engineers, professors, mm -hmm. scientists. It's so humbling when you drive to a grave. And I'm sure you've attended funerals, mm -hmm. burial ceremonies. Mm -hmm. It's just so humbling. Mm -hmm. And you, you are asking yourself, are you any better than those who are six feet down? <laughs> so, I, now, let me share it's this so with funny you. To say that. Have you ever driven by a junkyard? Junkyard. Yeah, there you have things that people almost you, kill themselves you know, over. Why, why I'm laughing is because uh, we went to Montego Bay sometime last year. And, uh, right. <laughs> the tour guide on passing by the graveyard this is the this is the way he described it and we were not paying attention and if you if you were not quick on your feet or in your head you would miss exactly what he said he said uh right here is land uh where everybody pays the same price you don't have to <laughs> you don't have to negotiate <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> he said right here 
you know, you can reserve your plot. <laughs> Everybody pays the same price. You don't have to negotiate nothing with anybody. I'm like, really? Then I thought about it. I was like, oh my God, that's the graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> I was interviewing, um, I was, into, and if you want to take part in this conversation, pick up your phone. Dial 240 603 7367. Uh, Mrs. Beatrice uh, Tanga in Texas told me she'll be <laughs> she'll be on this night. <laughs> anyway, so maybe uh, we if you want to dial, you can dial 240 or anyone, by the way, anyone if you want to participate live, yeah. share your ideas and so on. Please dial in, don't call me later on, divine. <laughs> I wish I knew <laughs> that you were on. <laughs> anyway, um, I was interviewing um one of the best heart surgeons in this country. Uh, Professor Nche Abegli Zama, uh -huh. Professor of Harvard. Mm -hmm. And um, he told me that sometimes when he's passing around the hospital, they think there's a janitor. <laughs> it's, That's right. be, because, you see, in the minds of many people, mm -hmm. when you're a big professor of heart surgery in Harvard, for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, you, you get into a crowd and everybody ought to know Mm -hmm. Who you are. Who you are. Yeah, <laughs> Who you are. Mm -hmm. And Professor Zama just wowed me, blew me away. He's just the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can run into him without knowing. Yep. And, and, and here, is, here is what he shared with me. He said, look, Divine, um, you, it, whatever you are, you are that because somebody was caring enough to place his or her shoulder for you to climb on. Climb on. You remember the song, You Raise Me Up? Mm -hmm. All right, beautiful. Now, we're going to switch gears to, um, um, to anger. Lillian, oh, I've yeah. seen people, gentlemen in suits, mm -hmm. looking like lawyers, <laughs> going to a courtroom. They park and their cars yeah. and they're punching get each other. Get a fight. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Over a parking space. That's right. <laughs> over a parking space. Lillian, uh, somebody will say, look, divine, easier said and done. Don't people have a right to be angry? Jesus Christ was anger, angry yeah. and beat people in the church. Yeah, anger is a healthy emotion. If it's I'm too far away from being Jesus Christ. <laughs> so don't I have and, a right to be angry? No, anger is a good, it's a healthy emotion, provided it is controlled. Now, you, you, can, you should be angry, it's an emotion that you need to express. You need to steam, let that steam out. But it has to be controlled. You cannot afford to carry anger forever and ever. Anger is a healthy emotion that needs to be expressed. And it is a good emotion, but it has to be controlled. You cannot allow anger take over reasoning. Granted, during the first five minutes of your anger, there is no reasoning at that time because it's just... Your hormones are going crazy and the, 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 the emotion needs to come up. But because you have to put it on the, in check, don't allow it to destroy you. Because if it goes long enough, it does not only destroy the, the, the object at which you are, the anger is being thrown, it destroys also the subject. So you have to be careful about how you express anger. Some people have said, Lillian, that there is something called righteous anger. What's the line between righteous and unrighteous anger? Huh. How do you explain the two? <laughs> well, what's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. The terms we need to use to be able to describe or to, to try to make, uh, to differentiate all these feelings. Anger is anger. You are angry about something. You, you have a right to be angry about that stuff. But if you give yourself a minute after all that pent up emotion has been thrown out there, just ask yourself. So after that, what does it benefit me to keep harboring this emotion? What does it benefit me? If anything, it keeps, if you keep it built up in you, that anger spews over. Sometimes, most of the times, if you do think about it, the person even at whom you are angry at, it does not even remember what it was about. Now you harbor it, you carry it in you, and it goes and festers, and it becomes something else. It destroys your health. It destroys your opportunities. It even stops you from rational behavior. Therefore, Anger is a healthy emotion. Again, anger is a healthy emotion, but it must be checked. 
Let me share something my child will experience with you. <laughs> you know, growing up back in Africa, you, you, you go to primary school, you all day at school, you come back, grandma, you mm -hmm. think mama or grandma kept your food somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then you rush, you're so hungry. Yep. And then you rush into the kitchen, look at the shelf where you thought your food, I mean, where your food always is when you return from school. Right. Guess what? You, you find a note on mm -hmm. the table that you should go, go to the farm or to do some farm. other thing mm -hmm. or get your food cooked. Mm -hmm. And then I, I got so pissed at some point. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to make fire. I, I have mm -hmm. dried twigs. I gather twigs back home. You know, you, mm -hmm. it's not like here you go just light the stove. Light the stove, really. Mm -hmm. And then you're good to go. Now, I try to put the firewood together. It will, The fire would not catch it. Take water out of anger and pour into the pour fire. It. And then sit somewhere and mm -hmm. start crying. Mm -hmm. Because, you see, and this you see, this is, um, you, you can call this um, juvenile behavior. Sure, of course. And all of us, I'm sure, oh, identify yeah. with what oh, I'm yeah. talking about. Mm -hmm. But as adults, mm -hmm. we find ourselves behaving that way. Same Many way. people. Yes. Otherwise, how do you explain, Lillian, that two gentlemen in a suit, mm -hmm. or in suits, <laughs> they pack, they, they're punching each other uh -huh. over a parking space in front of a shopping mall? Mm -hmm. uh, it's and are crazy. they where their children they watching them? What yeah, an, what uh, an it's example! Crazy. What an example! Y you imagine that somebody out of anger, mm -hmm. pent up anger, yeah, picks up a gun, kills mm -hmm. somebody, yes. or stabs somebody right. with a knife, exactly, and then has to be arrested and to spend the whole time, right, their lifetime in jail. In jail, is it worth it? Worth it. That is the big question. Is it worth it? Worth it. Now, Lilian, tell me, what is it that fuels this out of control behavior? Because this is, this is what it is. Okay. What fuels it? Okay, right. We we are, we already addressed this in the beginning, right? <clears throat> anger. Some people actually do need anger management. That is for sure. Uh, what we have learned here in this society and if you bring it back to our african society oh my god so many people will need to go for anger management um and we already addressed it in the beginning it has to do most of the time the anger is actually not directed at the it is not even the instance or the situation that that brought out that anger most of the time the stuff that is already pent up in there and build up and build up and they just need a little bit of something to tilt them over to that to the other side and so that's why i always advise people be very careful whether if it's in the workplace whether it's at home whether it's at whether in the community you have no idea what people are dealing with you have no idea what is going on in their lives therefore always play the defensive yeah people might term you weak or something so what if being weak saved your life and saved your family's life, so be it. Because if you are to re retaliate, and then that person who was already on the edge, through no fault of yours, you have no responsibility for why they are where they are in their lives. And then you go out of your way, out of character, and you respond to their already animated self. And then you tilt them over, and that person takes a gun. Let's say you are out there in the open, or the, you you get into a fist fight. You end up in jail. Your family is suffering, or you get hurt, and you're in the hospital. You ask yourself when you take a look back at it, and you ask yourself that one question: Was it worth it? And if the answer is no, and I want to borrow from Doctor Dr. Vando the other day when <laughs> she was here to say, <laughs> even when her husband makes her mad. She turns and looks at him and said, it is not good for you to be alone. <laughs> she I thought be that amazed was brilliant. How many, how many times I've used that phrase just from the time that Dr. Vando was on this show. I have used that phrase so many times. So ladies, Inwardly in my house. Ladies, <laughs> when your man, when your husband drives you crazy, you <laughs> just tell, turn and tell your husband, <laughs> God was wise to say it's not good for you to be alone, be alone. <laughs> <laughs> before you jump down the cliff. I know. <laughs> um, yeah. Anger. Lillian, anger is manifested in different ways. Different mm -hmm. things provoke. 
are there times you are angry, you Lillian? And how do you how how, how do you exercise control over yourself over when it. you're angry? Okay. Yeah. If you ask a lot of my friends now, if you ask people who knew me before, um, they would tell you I used to be extremely volatile. Volatile, not really angry and stuff like that. I've never been an angry black woman now. I used to be volatile just in my way that I approach people. Like How did you overcome that? Tell it, it. No, it's maturity and a continuous work in progress. I am a work in progress. I recognize it when it's coming on. I recognize that bad behavior when it's coming on. And I literally tell myself, I'm not going to be that person. I'm not going to let A or B push me to that other side. No. And, and when I say no to it, I say no to it. And I psych myself. I psych myself and talk myself out of it, do different things. In the beginning, it used to be extremely challenging because it would just depress my spirit. But right now, I have so many things that I can divert my attention or my thinking to. And like I say, rightly say sometimes, oh, you really don't. If I decide you, you don't exist, for trust me, you will not even exist. Not in my memory. Mm -mm. Lillian, you've been married for 30 years. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. And, um, extend my congratulations to Professor Wap Ignatius Fomenung, your yeah, husband. We still, we still have like almost two weeks to go, September 15. That two weeks is important. <laughs> Don't do anything that messes up your record. <laughs> because you better not. But, but the, here's, why, yeah. here's why I evoke your 30 years of experience as a married woman. Um, what is it? I'm, I'm sure that there are times that your husband just drove you nuts. Oh, yeah. The times you ask I yourself, him nuts too. how did I find myself mm -hmm. in this thing? Yes. And, and, and the times also you've driven him crazy. Oh, my God. So many times. Okay. So <laughs> how do you, how have you navigated those tough times, those oh. incidents of turbulence to be able to score, to have on your scorecard? Mm -hmm three decades uh, because um i have i have just never um and tr through training myself and talking to myself a lot i've just never let it fester uh, or anger or or hurt or something fester to the point where it goes overboard because i always come back to this same question that you you we talked about in the beginning is it worth it? Now, once I rationalize things like that in my mind, I say to myself, is it worth it? And if the answer is no, it's not worth it, I just don't engage in it. That's just how it's been. I just don't engage in it. And then most of the times, always, not even most of the times, always, I always do that score check card, which um, Dr. Vando talked about. And nobody <laughs> taught me this. Nobody really taught me this. This was just my own thinking and my own way of doing it. And like I said, maybe, you know, the spirit and God designed it that it should be that way. Nobody taught me this. But I always do a scorecard with that individual. Like my husband, for instance, I do a scorecard. What are his best qualities? Once I line them up and I look at those little few things here and there that are unnerving and I'm like... Maybe he came back from from teaching engineering and did not keep his shoes where it should be <laughs> oh no that one is that that one is a given and 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 oh no we don't need that's not even a point to argue about or to quarrel about but you'll be surprised lillian that those little grains of discord uh -huh. could become baobabs in relationships that okay, just... okay. let me let me give you an, an example like just this afternoon okay this afternoon at home now, somebody might think that's not worth it or that's not bad enough, right? I had about three or four. This is like my fourth Zoom call on which I was on teaching uh, CWA aspirants this afternoon. And um, I left my pot on the fire. He had gone out of there. He was leaving the house and I didn't know. My pot was on the fire and he was there. He saw it. It was actually getting burned. So he turned the stove off. He left. He came back. We had another conference, another Zoom call, and we were all on it. And I had left another pot on the fire, different pot this time, and it got burned. 
and he turned it off. <laughs> so <laughs> I went downstairs and he was like, all the time, you go to all these meetings, you don't pay attention to anything you're doing. So you leave your pot on the fire. I've turned off one burn pot already. This is the second burn pot. And I opened it. And when he turned it off, he had put water in it, which makes it worse. Okay. So I just said to myself, I'm not even going to, to, to quarrel over that because he's completely right. I should have paid attention. Okay. And I just let it. And he just said that and he walked away. All right. We didn't quarrel. So when, when I, had what i had to say to him so when he came back very unsuspectingly i just said um come over here he did he came over so i said okay fyi and these are my words fyi <laughs> next time when you turn my pot off please don't put water in it <laughs> just calmly like that you know I, I wasn't going to have that fighting match with him at the time that he was mad no women women make a mistake by or and even some men too like when the woman just go jab 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 and then the man too goes jab 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 and then it's all over in the house and then the two of you and when the two of you are talking it, it becomes a test of wheels right. when the two of you are talking nobody's listening that's a fact when two people are talking around nobody's <laughs> they're listening. screaming <laughs> and, and i tell you what mm -hmm. the interesting thing is they are screaming at each other even though they're right in front of each other right <laughs> It becomes a test of wheels. My children tell me that. Okay, the mommy don't <laughs> shout. And I'm not shouting. I say, I'm not shouting, and I'm shouting. <laughs> so I guess it's our African way of doing it. They yes, like, what... Uh, shout, but I'm shouting. Mm -hmm. Anger can... It's amazing when you see people express anger. It, it's amazing. Yes. Sometimes you're wondering, what is it only that thing, or it's... A, a, a combination. <laughs> it's a combination. True. No. Accumulation anger, of other things is cumulative. I don't think, I don't know about other people, but I don't think anger is usually the spark of what just happened. No. I think anger is more like a combination of things that have happened and piled up and piled up. And then all of a sudden, that little spark just blows the lid off of the pot and everything just spills out. And uh, think about it, Need Divine. Mm hmm. I've never heard anybody angry and said anything rational. <laughs> insults, no, crazy. insults come out, things that you did not mean to say in that moment of anger, things that you did not, you did not even intend for it to come out, all sorts of words come out. And just remember this, when you are angry and you go off on that emotion to try to say anything reasonable, which is never reasonable, you're going to sp spill out words and things that will be difficult for you to take back. And once it's already out there, guess what? And so always ask yourself this question. Was it worth it? Is it worth it? And once it's not worth it, just, just walk away. Just walk away. It's because you walk. can always walk away. You can always walk away. Even though sometimes, like, you know, we used to have this phrase in Yaoundé, which said, <laughs> You know, everybody has that five minutes. And sometimes I say to God, just give me five minutes with the devil. And when I'm done, just like Christ did, when I'm done, then I come back to God. You say you can you can always walk away. People don't always walk away. They, they want to... Sh I, I, yeah, I will you give you a piece of my mind. You want to satisfy that, that, that beast in I'll you give you a piece of my mind. Yes. I, I will so show you know. that I'm more than you. Right. So which is that pride again? You see, so that anger, that is that pride again, because you want to demonstrate to the other person that you two are worth something. Because by their angry words and by them doing what they're doing to you, they have somehow debased you and you want to reestablish that power. Now, re-establishing power, the force is always in that silence. That dignified force is always in that silence. Trust me, it solves a lot of problems. Here's what Professor um, Nche Abegli Zama, mm -hmm. talking about this issue of people trying to assert themselves, mm -hmm. you know, especially a masculinity by trying to demean other people. Mm -hmm. um, he says sometimes you win by not doing anything. That's right. You, you win by not doing anything. Yeah. And if, if you're always trying to be the hero, 
-hmm. you go home and not sleep. And not sleep, yes. And yes. not sleep. And the other person is sleeping and snoring. Yes. Snoring. Mm -hmm. You thinking about what you should do or say to that person the next time you see the person in church <laughs> or at school or at workplace. You, and, and, you, that's what it's in. That's what occupies your mind. Right, right. And it's self uh, destructive. Yes, Lillian. Yes, yes. And I was just going to also say that sometimes um, some people's demeanor comes across as prideful and they are really not that way until you get to know them. Now, I was going to give an example uh, about my first daughter. She is. Um, she used to be extremely and still is kind of somewhat reserved and introverted. Now, so when she was in fourth grade, uh, a teacher called us to school one day and we had never been called to school before, just sent a note through her and asked for us to come to school that she was concerned about something. So we show up and we had this conference and the teacher said in front of her uh, was just saying, you know, she's a little concerned that uh, she just stays in class and never puts her hand up. She just sits there and just looking at her. And, uh, and that she's even surprised that she's that way because she's a straight A student. And so I, I, we listened, my husband and I were there, we listened and after she finished, so I asked her one question, I said, um, is she ever rude? Does she, she said, no, she does everything right, but she just never raises her hand in class. So my husband said, okay, ma'am, I just want to say this to you that, um, I have been praying that none of my kids take after me because I am quiet like that and I need them to be out there. And uh, I just want to say to you that that is just how I am. And I'm sure my daughter just takes after me and I don't think she means any harm. And so we turned and we asked her, we said, is there anything child? Why don't you put your hand up? She said nothing, didn't say anything. So when we walked out of the office, the, the teacher's office, and I would just told her, well, we will encourage her to Put her hand up some more so when we walked out of the office so i turned and i held her said mama why don't you raise your hand up in class she said if the teacher stops asking stupid questions i'm like huh <laughs> so can you imagine if if this had come out in front of the teacher you know sometimes some people are just quiet because they, they, and like they say, when they're quiet, they have a lot in their head to say, but they just don't want to say it. So that boastful person, just don't think that because you go around flaunting yourself is because you know a lot or you have a lot. If you just think about it, there might be a lot of people around you who have more than you do, who know more than you do. And so if you come from that position of humility, knowing that you know nothing and don't know everything about everything, if you come from that position of humility, it will surely tame your character and tone you down. Here's what I get from you this evening. And before we get to the next segment of our discussion, this one. This is Chat Night Africa from Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. I'm your host, Divine Chamukong, and my guest this evening is Mrs. Uh, Lillian uh, Fomono. Lillian, what has greed and pride got to do? What's the connection between the two? Greed and pride. Okay, um, unfortunately, these are two vices that really, really sometimes go together uh, because if you find people who are aggressive in behavior and are boastful, uh, they are always wanting to acquire more, to have more, so as to maintain that that um, ego or that part of them that wants to brag about more. And most of the times, it's really not to fulfill any, it's not really to because they need it, it's just because it is out there and I can be able to grab it because I can. And they've told themselves so many times, yes, I can. Now, um, healthy greed. There is some health, there's something called healthy greed, which healthy greed uh, borders more on ambition and healthy ambition, uh, meaning that you use your talent, what God has given you to be able to get more so you can be of service to people. Now, if having more 
it's not going to let you be of service to people with the more that you have acquired then it becomes unhealthy then you just acquire these things because you are greedy and just keep having them and i would encourage people to actually watch there's a show called american greed it would teach you a thing or two and just to imagine also that having that that big like my dad used to say um, you could have like 17 rooms and you can only sleep in one, you know. So if you come from that position of even if I amass all these things, if they are not for serving other people, if they're not to be used in service to other people, what are they really for? You know, um, we we had someone pass away uh, some time back and uh, you won't believe it, in her closet, this was a, a, a former patient of mine uh in her closet she has she still had clothes in there from mima marcos and all these other places with tags on them that had never been worn and she just kept you know would go out there and just shop 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 for more and so if we ask ourselves this question especially this COVID 19 time has really taught a lot of people a lot of lessons all those things that we went out there bought them with all those thousands of dollars spent on clothes and shoes and you have been told you cannot wear them and take them anywhere there are no parties to go to there are nothing there's nothing you can do about that <laughs> and all those coats all those uh whatever they call them where do you guys get those coats from now all those things and look lillian i tell you what things. um they're hanging in the closet i, I, I love to them. i love to look sharp <laughs> And uh, I have all these suits lined up in my closet. I, yeah. At some point, I have to wear a suit to go buy grocery. <laughs> that makes me Vanity of right. all vanities. Big, it's all vanity. Oh, honestly. Right. You, there was a time I was in hospital and I had to not work for three months after major <laughs> exactly. surgery. They were all lined up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I had only my pajamas. That's <laughs> it. Only, That's it. The, so sometimes we pay attention to things that really, really, yeah, right. really don't matter. matter. We're fighting over stuff. Yes. That's why I said, drive by the junk yard. You see what people almost kill themselves over <laughs> at some point. It's the junk yard. Yes. <laughs> and you see COVID-19. I'm going to ask for you to um, draw lessons mm -hmm. considering the themes that we've been exploring tonight on this show to draw lessons from COVID-19. Yep. What has COVID-19 taught us? What should Ooh. we every day continue to remind ourselves of when we look at all these vanities of life? Right. Lillian. Virus is no respecter of no person, race, class, uh, gender, anything the virus can get you whenever it wants i just and i used to make people laugh about this and it's something it's something to think about you know the virus has actually slept in buckingham palace and i've never been to the gates of buckingham palace you know that right <laughs> the virus you, has you, actually you, slept with prince charles but you you're talking about devices of greed lillian some people argue that they've been so generous which i assume is the opposite of yeah. greed uh -huh. And people take them for granted. Um, think about it this way, yeah. And 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 I always say, if and, that's and the case, to, what's wrong with being greedy? You will, yeah. And and it's like um, I used to be that way too until I'm I'm rethinking. And and it's not bad not to. And the worst thing, uh, me divine is if you think about it, those that you look up to, and actually expect them to be generous and not be greedy. My goodness, they have just shone the light and taught us not to even judge the book by the cover. How so true. Take a look at around and especially what is called like the prosperous, what do they call them? The prosperous uh, evangelicals, prosperous preaching, prosperity preaching, prosperous pastors, not to take away anything from anybody, but how do you feel going around in your million dollar jet with your con people in your congregation that are starving. They are literally people in your congregation that have nowhere to live. How do you feel? Okay, now, I, I, am I saying people should just take their wealth and go around in the street and, and distribute it? Even that, yes, why not? 
why not? If you think, if you, if you have so much and kept there, that is not going to be of any value to you. I'm not even saying after you are gone, you are not lacking in anything. You're not lacking in the basic necessities. How, what, do, what hurt does it, or what do, does it cost you to get that your excess and go out there and just give it? Now, if I can, if I could, and that's not to say with the little I have, I shouldn't be able to give. I should still be able to give because you just never know. You just never know. What are the benefits of giving, being generous? Ooh. Oh, my goodness. If people would Why just Why shouldn't know. it benefit you from keeping your stuff to yourself, hoarding stuff? <laughs> uh, well, sometimes, and I call myself too, sometimes I'm a hoarder. That's true. Because the things that, I, and you won't even believe this, things that I left back in Cameroon back then before I moved to the state, I went back and I was furious that some of my cousins had gone into my stuff and they had completely taken everything out of the box and there was nothing left. But think about it, Nidiva. When was I ever, ever going to wear any one of those things? When? <laughs> when? <laughs> It's the desire to always amass. You have it and look at it, right? Oh and, my and, God. And, 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 yes. and, and just and, keep amassing it and just and, keep acquiring it. Mm -hmm. And tell yourself. And I, you I, I realized something. Uh, it, 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 the reason why we're carrying, this carrying on with this conversation, Lillian, is so that people, it's like we're holding up the lamppost, the mirror, mm -hmm. so that all of us, mm -hmm. both of us included, yes. we look at ourselves in the mirror and ask the question, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hey, Madam, let Lillian just told you, if your husband is trying to give you trouble, just say, truly, it's yeah, not I'll good for you to be alone. alone. <laughs> That's a good one. I love it, Lillian. Let's conclude the broadcast today on, on, on hate. Yes. Here's what Mandela said. Yes. You see, when Mandela was in prison, um, it was thought, I used to read a lot of Time magazine, Western newspapers, then I was in Africa. And all the predictions were that there would be hell in South Africa when blacks became in charge. Right. It, it, there would be hell. Here is what Mandela did, and it just shocked the world. When he was released from prison, the first thing he did was to invite the wives of the generals who were torturing black South Africans to lunch. People were like, what kind of man is this? Mm -hmm. His response was that, and I'm paraphrasing this, when you keep hurt or hate in your heart, Amen. the target it destroys isn't that person you hate, it is you. Yep. It's like you drink poison mm -hmm. and thinking that the person who hurt you die first. Yes. There could be nothing more brilliant. That's, and that's what why I said wherever it. Mandela went, yep. wherever he walked into, there was light. Yep. People stood up. People more intelligent, more educated, more politically powerful than him stood up yep. to acknowledge him. That's right. But remember what I said in the beginning that the 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 anger does not destroy the object. It destroys the subject. It's corrosive. It, yes. des it destroys you. It destroys yeah. mm -hmm. the container. It destroys the subject. It doesn't destroy the object at which you're you're re you know uh, projecting that anger. It destroys you. So if you keep it in, and one other thing also, how self-destructive this can be, uh, which goes to the theme of the evening about you know getting getting being in your getting in your own way, and and if you take out those things that we've just identified this evening, the greed, the anger, and uh, the self-defeating prophecies that you tell yourself, I'm not good enough, I'm not worth it, and all that. If you take them out of the way, you will be amazed at the things that you can accomplish. You will be amazed at what you can accomplish. Just take away those stumbling blocks, which are nothing but standing in your own way. Nobody can help you with it. To be able to take away that spirit of anger and that that character, that boastful behavior, which destroys everything in its path, only you can do it. And you can tell yourself for it, your 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 gain for, from being greedy or your gain from being boastful is very temporal. But if you shift those away, you have long-lasting gains, such as company of people, which is what you will need 
in the long run because once you start being you once you keep up that that boastful behavior which is so repugnant to people people will drift away from you even the things that you think you will be able to acquire and you're fighting to get soon they will all dry up because there will be nobody people can't get they, they, nobody is obliged to, to to be with you because of your bad behavior now nobody is obliged to be with you you know why some people are going to hate you for saying all this mm. and hate this broadcast? Uh huh. That be that be all right. Because <laughs> they are seeing themselves as a selfie. Take a yes. selfie. You yes. you know why people take selfies, Lillian? You see, when you take a selfie, those you keep are those you think you were smiling properly there. Uh -huh. When it when you think just the smile didn't go right, delete, uh -huh. delete. People don't want to look at themselves in the mirror. That's the point. Yes. They don't want to look at themselves in the, and if people did. Because Probably the world would be a, it's a dangerous practice. Exactly, mm -hmm. and people will be a lot happier. Mm -hmm. So please, if we're stepping on your toes this evening, listen on. I have no doubt in my mind that all the discussions we have in these conversations will help you. Mm -hmm. It's helping me. Yeah. I also do this show for myself yes. because self improvement is not a destination; it's a mm -hmm. journey. It's a journey. That's right, That's Lillian. Right before your last word. Lillian, Mrs. Formanum, your last word. All right. I've wrote a couple of points here. Share them. I'm just going to share. Uh, Self-defeating prophecies is a poison. It stops us from achieving. It stops us from achieving love, happiness, and success. So do away with self-defeating prophecies. Tell yourself this every morning. I can, I can, and I can. No matter what you've been told before, you can simply because there's a purpose for which you were made. Uh, and that purpose until it's arrived at, until it's achieved, your maker is not going to leave you alone. So just keep telling yourself, I am here to be used by God and I am here to be used to fulfill his prophecy. Now you're not here by chance, you're not here to please anybody, but you're here simply to accomplish what God had put you here to accomplish. Now everything you do, anything you have, it is not by your might, it is not by your power, but it is only by his grace. Whether you are spiritual or not, there's a reason why you are here. And so you better stand up to it and tell yourself every day in the morning, thank you to your maker, to whoever brought you here. To me, it's my God. And so I thank you, God, every day for bringing me, for making me who I am. And you're here for a purpose. Now, there's also a quote by um, Richard Branson, which I always love. Uh, to 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 think about and also love to to always ponder on and it says if someone gives you an opportunity but you're not sure to do it say yes then find then learn how to do it now so what that simply means is uh it, it actually goes very well into the american psyche or fake it until you make it but it's also a teaching tool it also will help you to achieve a whole lot of stuff if someone gives you an opportunity, do not use that self-defeating prophecy to say, I cannot. Say, yes, I can. Thank you for this opportunity. Step up to it. Take that opportunity. Then learn how to live up to the challenges that that opportunity is giving you. Well, you see, I keep bringing you back and you'll come back again. <laughs> That's because, you see, you don't dip your finger into a honey jar once. That's right. It's sweet. You go second time, <laughs> number three time, fourth time. I'm simply saying that it's been wonderful having you on the show today. And I'm sure that uh, all the things we've thrown light on mm -hmm. would help a lot of people. If you like what you heard on the show today, even if it challenges you, at some point you say, these guys are still talking nonsense, mm -hmm. share it. Sometimes right. it's nonsense that you don't want that to hear. Exactly. That helps you. Mm -hmm. You see, 
<laughs> what helps you is like so that. Yeah, go also, ahead. Sorry, uh, Divine, to interrupt you. Um, we would also love to speak with people who think that anger or retaliation is the best tool. You know, we would love we would have loved to speak to somebody who actually has achieved anything through anger. Right. We would have loved to speak to somebody who has actually used anger and it has helped them to achieve anything. Let me share something before we go. And I'm borrowing from Professor Ncha Abeglizama. When you go to a park parking, to a mall, mm -hmm. don't park close to the building because then you get aggravated and all these people are shouting and screaming because all of you are fighting to mm -hmm. park close to the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Park far away. <laughs> you. First of all, you save yourself that trouble of quarreling with people over a parking space. <laughs> Number two, work out is cumulative. It, 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 you, you, you exercise. You exercise by walking down mm -hmm. to the grocery store. So you see what that does for you. So don't always want to park near the building because you start, you start fighting with people and they're showing you thumbs, whatever, middle finger and all that stuff, uh -huh. f you and stuff. It's not worth it. Mm -hmm. And even if people did, you don't have to respond. Yes, exactly. You see, it's not all battles that mm -hmm. you need to fight. If you won the battle, there's no trophy to take home. What's right. the point? Yes. Choose your battles. Choose your battles. Right. Thank you, Lillian. It's been wonderful. Uh, you give my regards to um, to your husband, your family, your daughters, and so on. Thank you. Thank to Pani Kuna, he's, he's my idol. I love him so much. Thank that. you. Thank you. I, wish, you. I wish he knew how to use Facebook. He would have been on. <laughs> I know that. I know that. I know that. I know that. Yes. Thank you so much. My and uh, that's how we round off on this edition. Attention. That has been Chat Night Africa from Washington, D.C., metropolitan area. And we had this beautiful woman on the screen as our guest as she waves goodbye to you. That's been Lillian Fomono. That has been Chat Night Africa from Washington, D.C., metropolitan area. I will be meeting you for another jaunty broadcast on this platform. We had uh, as production advisor, Dr. B. Tatsung Fomunem, studio manager Beatrice Fomunen. We have a broadcast transmission director, Mumbalingwa, social media platforms manager and video editor, Sir Roger Fool. This has been Chat Night Africa from Washington, D.C., metropolitan area. Chat Night. The power of Chat Night production assistants, Emmanuel Wayindi, John Tanto, and um, Uncle Lot Benson at uh, Fonta Street, Bamenda. Chat Night Africa is presented and uh, live from Washington, D.C., metropolitan area by Divine Chamukong. <laughs> I also want to thank all of you who were watching. Daniel Eno, my special, my very special person at Chat Night Africa. Daniel, we wish you all the best where you are. We had to have uh, Christine Quine this evening on the show, but she had an emergency and that's why she couldn't be on the show. She will be back next time. Merci à tout le monde. That has been Chat Night Africa. I'll come back again. Goodbye. Au revoir. Au revoir.